So next up is John Howard. Um, John has had a long career in game development. Um, one of the notable stops he had in his career was uh, on the HoloLens team at Microsoft as creative director. About a year, a little over a year ago, um, he co-founded a company called Look, and um, they're just up on Capitol Hill, mixed reality shop, and um, today he's going to be talking with us about uh, spatial UI in the mixed reality space, and I've seen this presentation before. It's phenomenal. I know you guys are going to really enjoy it, so take it away, John. Thank you. Uh, so, let's do this. Does this work? Let's try. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Um, I talk with my hands. I'll try and keep that to a minimum so the microphone doesn't go flailing. Uh, oh, good. Awesome. All right. Cool. Um, so, as Anne said, my name is John Howard, um, co founder and creator of Look. Um, and prior to co founding the company, was a creative director at Microsoft on the HoloLens project uh, in the Experiences Group working with. NASA, Autodesk, and Trimble. Can you get? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to look for you, and you're going to help me. All right. This is awesome. Uh, working with NASA, Autodesk, and Trimble on their initial HoloLens experiences, um, trying to help them understand how that's going to impact their business and what they do, and then using that to show the world how HoloLens is going to impact uh, the world through uh, uh, mixed reality. Um, <clears throat> So today what I'm going to talk about is spatial UX and spatial UI. People talk about it as volumetric UI, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you pay any attention to the space, you've probably seen statistics like this. Um, you know, uh, we expect virtual and augmented reality to become a hundred or an $80 billion business by 2025, roughly the size of the desktop business today. Um, and I think, you know, there's plenty of articles that talk about different numbers and people say these numbers are garbage and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that if we're going to make this space grow, um, there are a number of big challenges to overcome here. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is that most UX and UI design is still focused on flat two-dimensional screens. Um, if you take a step back and you consider it, the UI uh, and UX on a Mac is not fundamentally different from the what it is on an iPhone. You still have icons, you still have text, and the way you're interacting with in terms of content is you know, images, videos, text, audio. And that's a pretty big gap between true spatial experiences where content is coming not on a screen, but is actually in the real world around us. And there's a big gap between the UX and UI required to make those experiences happen. And so if we're going to make this virtual reality, mixed reality future uh, come true, we need to answer a question, which is, how do we make the jump from 2D to 3D? Um, and you know, the quick answer that everyone wants to go to is like, well, it'll be like the movies. It'll be like Iron Man. It'll be awesome. It'll be great. But the reality is that when you try and take some of these ideas from fiction and bring them into the real world, there are some real problems. So for example, you know, this thing in front of my eye is annoying. If I lock a piece of UI here, not only is it in front of my vision, but when I go to turn my head, it turns to and then I do this, and that sucks. Um, you know, this isn't fun for five minutes, let alone five hours, uh, even though it looks great in a movie. And even if we go to something interactive, like video games, um, this doesn't work either, right? So this is from a game called The Division. This UI appears in the world in front of the character. But the way this is working in a game is we're actually using a trick. We're using a separate render pass to put the UI in the frame. And if this were a spatial UI on this table, you know, in front of me here, the bottom half would be clipped to the table and I couldn't use the buttons on the bottom and that would suck. So even when we try to do something more interactive, there are some big problems to overcome. And these are sort of real challenges that impact our ability to create spatial experiences. And so, that helps me a little bit. So, Building a robust and well understood toolbox for spatial UX and UI is really what's necessary so that we can get beyond the space of spending half or more of our projects figuring out how to make the UX and UI work at all and more and more time spent on actually creating that UI. And one of the reasons I like giving these kind of talks is because. We need more talented, brilliant people working in this space. The more people that start working in this space, the sooner we start identifying what those items are, what those elements of that UI UX toolbox are, 
So we spend more and more time thinking about what the experiences are and the tools we're creating rather than just the UI. Um, the good news, though, after all the silly pictures from movies, is that there's actually real work being done in this space, and that these beginning rules of spatial UX and UI are being written now, and that this innovation is happening daily. I first gave the version of this talk at a conference about a year ago. I've seen really innovative new stuff happen in that same year. We'll see more stuff happen this year, and we'll continue to evolve um, until we have a rich and well-understood set of tools. But for now, what I call the spatial UX UI toolbox breaks down into a set of categories. And this is by no means intended to be an exhaustive list. Um, and the emphasis, is, the emphasis here and in the examples I'm going to show is based on mixed reality, specifically a lot of HoloLens projects because it's the work I'm familiar with and it's the work that I've done some of um, in terms of the examples. But a lot of this is applicable to any time you're using spatial UI. Uh, and I'm not even going to cover all of this because I want to keep it short. Uh, there are a lot of pictures, uh, so that's always fun. Um, I'm going to cover a portion of this list. Uh, and so I just want to dive into this first one. So in starting, let's just talk about user gaze. So user gaze is incredibly powerful as, a, as the user is an active participant without asking anything of them that they're not already doing. Similar to uh, you know, the notion of chatbots where if I can type or talk, I can interact with it. If I can look around and observe my environment, I can use my gaze to be an active participant. So I'm going to show you a quick video. This is actually from something that Microsoft, one of the hell and that Microsoft created for the uh, uh, Halo experience at E3 2015. This is combining a set that they built on the show floor with a holographic component. And again, all it's requiring out of the audience and the users is just for them to look around. Audio? Louder, if there's audio. Eh, it's all just music, it's fine. Oh, well, there we go. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. What they did is they built a set, um, think about like a Disney dark ride, that, and they had people in lab coats put the HoloLens on you and then guide you down this hall just following a, a, you know, a, an objective marker like you would in a video game into this briefing room. And then during the briefing, uh, the holographic character is explaining to you this new game mode in Halo, but it's all done in fiction as you stand around this briefing table. Um, everyone here, everyone is seeing the same experience, but it's tailored for them and their perspective. As you look at different elements of the table, things light up and react to your gaze. And again, all we're asking you to do is just be an observer and sort of uh, uh, take in that experience. This kind of stuff is incredibly valuable. Knowing where the user is looking and being able to drive actions and events simply of where the user is looking is incredibly powerful. Often when people build their first VR or spatial experiences, they kind of want to go full out. Understand that so much of your audience, and I'm sure anyone here that had a chance to try some of the demos in the other room had this experience, everything is new. Keep it simple, keep it short, and most of those people are gonna experience this thing for less than five minutes, and then they're gonna go away. And if they're tripped up by the technology and tripped up by the fancy stuff you're doing, it's gonna suck for them. They're not gonna leave with the message you want them to leave with, the experience you want them to leave with. If you're doing something like that, focusing on user gaze is great. So, evolving that a little bit, gaze cursor, actually using the user's gaze like a mouse or like your finger on a touch screen, um, is different. This is about prompting the user to start to take action. So this is a really um, simple but elegant example from Object Theory down in Portland. So what you're seeing here, and hopefully this is visible on the screen, is at the end of my gaze I have a plumb bob. And that plumb bob not only shows me where my gaze is in the world as I move my head around, like moving my mouse, but it also traces the contours of those objects, so I understand the dimensionality of the objects in that space. Um, and this is really good for you know, uh, tracking uh, distinctive, uh, distinctive spaces and smoothing that interaction so that, that feels very stable and very robust, the same way that your iPhone feels heavy when you pick it up and doesn't feel like a light, crappy piece of garbage. This is another example, does the exact same thing, but is using a, a light as opposed to an object, and I'm sure this is really hard for anyone on the first three rows to see. This light, as you look across these objects in the space, is, uh, as it moves from the skeletal to the circulatory to the muscular system, you're seeing the, 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 the shape of that object more because the light wraps around that shape and gives you a much clearer sense, a much more, almost, a, tactile feel for what that surface is like, again, simply by using your gaze and simply by interacting with it. 
Uh, I think as designers, often we forget about audio, um, we forget about sound, and, and, and it's really a missed opportunity to communicate more information um, and to really use a different input and a different, through a different set of senses to the user. Um, so this, for example, is an image from a HoloLens game created by one of the teams at Microsoft. It's called Robo Raid. And understand that everything in this image, everything in this scene, from the lasers that I fire, to the enemies breaking through the walls, to the enemies flying through the space, to the bullets that shoot at me, has a positional sound attached to it. So if there's an enemy behind me, I can just point, and I will be within less than, less than was it 10 degrees? Less than 10 degrees of accuracy to saying exactly where that thing is in space around me. That ability to know what is in my environment and to give those holographic components sound and audio, if I can trick your eyes and I can trick your ears, you can't tell me it's not real, right? Unless you go up and touch it. So that's a huge power to actually making these things real in the world. This has a lot of impact when we start dealing with remote collaboration scenarios. Users can easily distinguish who is who in a conversation simply by hearing, uh, you know, I have two avatars in front of me. Being able to position the voice on different avatars makes it very, very clear who is who in that room, suddenly you know, the fact that everyone's wearing like a skin tight monocolored bodysuit, that goes away really, really quickly once we start focusing on the work. But if I know that Jim is blue and Karen is in the red avatar, it's super easy and then I can track them to that space. So <clears throat> this one is funny. I get a little bit of grief from people for using the term haptic. Another way of thinking about this is audio force feedback. So uh, this will probably not work at all with audio, so I'm gonna use some sound effects, it's gonna be fun. Um, so I'm going to run this video twice, and what we're seeing is a ball running through the space, and it's going to collide with some of these blocks. And, well, that's not loud at all, that's terrible. Um, as we add sound to this, as we hear the ball roll across the surface, we can hear what the surface is like. As we bounce it into the walls, we hear the walls are made of metal. As it runs into the blocks, we hear that they're made of something else. This ability to make objects more real by imbuing them with sound properties that tell them how, tell us how they're going to interact with and behave. So if I can run my gaze across the surface and realize that it's a rough surface or a smooth surface, how does that help me in a scenario where I'm, you know, kicking out carpet? Right? Is it is it a, is it a smooth tile or is it a, a you know a, a shag carpet or is it thin carpet? How can that help me? give that object more interaction and more sense of tactile uh, feedback. So this also helps us in terms of how we use very traditional UI. So for example, the click, click, click sound on this graduated element that's allowing me to adjust the size of a fuel tank on this motorcycle tells me that it's a graduated action. It's not a smooth action. Um, virtual buttons tend to feel more real and have better interaction when they have really simple brush uh, and tap sounds even before you interact or click with them just as you move your gaze across them. We can also use this to create a sixth sense, right, and warn users of proximity to nearby hazards. So everyone has played Operation, right? You take the metal tweezers, you put them in the thing, you try and grab the plastic piece without touching the metal sides and getting a buzz. Well, what if I could give you a warning hum, like a high voltage capacitor the closer you move to those metal sides and tell you you were getting close to danger? Which sounds like a silly idea when you're talking about operation, but if we put it in an industrial hard helmet, so that anywhere I go on a job site, if I go towards dangerous objects, I get a warning even if I back into them, gives me a sixth sense. It allows me to use this information in ways that we can't do uh, with something on a screen or something on a tablet or something on our phone. Um, so one of the biggest challenges coming from traditional design or traditional UI, UX design, is the lack of a frame, right? We tend to put content in the center and controls on the edges. But when you do not have a frame around you, you don't have anywhere to anchor that stuff. And the real answer is that you actually make it context aware. You actually put it on the object itself and instantiate it in the moment. So for example, um, this is an indoor agriculture operation where everything in the environment is sensored. So this is an IoT scenario where I've got hydration and I've got nutrients and I've got lighting sensors and controls in this environment. And I can walk through the environment and I can look at all of my real-time sensor data and go, oh, why is section 55 shorter than everything else? Click, open it, click it up, click into it, bring up a context menu, get all of the real-time data for that as well as the historical data, 
see something I want to change, and then because of access to the controls from there, go in and make that change instantaneously. So I'm able to use intuition and then immediately dive in and get information and turn that into action without having to go back to a room without having to bring up a screen or a tablet because I can do it just by interacting with the object itself. Um, this is a really interesting example. I like this one a lot. I came, they came across this the other week. Um, this is a holographic painting app that Microsoft Research put together. And I like the idea that they create a frame of reference for this menu here. So think like Photoshop, I've got my, me my menu on the side. This one, I just put on my wrist like a bracelet. You're not gonna forget where that menu is by anchoring it to parts of your body. It gives you a really clear context where the stuff is. Um, in principle, in, sorry, in practice, this doesn't work quite as well, and that's more to do with the technology than it is the concept. But from a concept point of view, it's fantastic, and when it works, it works beautifully, and it's really delightful to use, and it feels like the way that things are gonna work in the future is awesome. Um, this is another practical example of context menu. So this is actually a tool that we built for uh, geologists on the Mars Curiosity Rover Program. So these are scientists that work with the robot that Mars sent to the NASA sent to Mars in 2011, and it brings back data for them. And what they want to be able to do is they need to be able to um, do geology surveys on uh, a recreation of the Martian surface. And so what we're doing here is just by looking at a point on the train. And I'll wait for this to loop again. By looking at a point on the train and selecting it, we're able to bring up a context menu and do incredibly complex um, geological survey planning just by a simple gaze tap gaze interface. So effectively a one button plus my gaze interface. Uh, and I think this is the last topic I'm gonna cover is um, extended desktop. So one of the unique elements and one of the unique capabilities of mixed reality is that it doesn't cut us off from the rest of the world around us. And what this means is it means we can use the other tools that are and workflows that are already at our disposal. Users are more readily, we're gonna more readily adopt a new tool if you can show them how it integrates with their existing tools and workflows and processes. So going back to that example with NASA, one of the reasons they chose to use HoloLens rather than a VR solution was they still have all these tools on their PC and they've got notes on their desk and they've got their phone. And if I put you in a VR environment so that you can experience the Martian terrain at a one-to-one -one scale, I can't use my computer anymore. I've got to take the goggles off. Well, in mixed reality, we can just let you continue to see your computer and then build Mars around you everywhere your computer isn't. And that even allows us to allow you to treat this like an extended desktop and literally move your cursor off the screen, click on the Martian terrain, and then get up and then use the spatial UI. So again, mixing the tools, figuring out what's best for each user, and allowing them to gradually work their way into these experiences. This is the same concept applied to an industrial design prototype for Autodesk. Any change I make on my computer monitor instantly shows up on my holograms. Treat the holograms like an extension of your computer desktop. Basically a holographic display that works in concert and in sync with your uh, desktop tools, because again, these industrial designers, we went and interviewed industrial designers, they were like, I don't want to do minority report crap, that sucks. I've spent tens of thousands of hours becoming an expert in AutoCAD or Rhino or whatever I use. I want to be, but I still want to be able to see my work in 3D, that's why I do so many 3D prints. So let me make changes here and instantly see them on my hologram here. That was actually great, that was a great learning from going to talk to those uh, industrial designers. And then once we've started playing with that, we can start playing with it even more. So we then took this and applied it to architects and said, okay, we work with Trimble and said, okay, architects want to use physical models, but they want to iterate quickly on their holographic model. Why don't we let you, this mouse is wireless, why don't I just walk up to my architectural model, and of course my video stopped looping, thanks PowerPoint. Um, why don't I walk up to my architectural model, take my mouse with me, and go and manipulate the holographic portion of my model as I walk around and stand around it? Why do I have to be, why do I have to be chained to my desk? So again, we can start to use these tools in new ways and merge these mixed reality tools and these spatial tools with our existing tools on our screens or our other workflows or even the physical elements of our work life that we use every day. Um, so, like I said, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list. Um, this is really just scratching the surface. Um, and I think it's, a, it, but it's hopefully a, an interesting overview that sort of gives you guys an idea about the kind of work that we're doing, the kind of challenges that we face in the work that we do and how we approach it. Um, you know, 
for me, I think that we really fundamentally believe in look that this mixed reality spatial future is coming and that <coughs> flat UX and UI design today is just not sufficient to tackle these new mediums in the way that they deserve. And that these standards for spatial UX and UI are still being created now. Um, but there's still a lot of discovery to happen. And so the one thing I would say for anyone that's interested in working in this space, and I hope more of you are, because it's really interesting and it's really challenging, and it forces you to think about things in a new way, which is always fun, is, you know, if there's one thing we can do where it wouldn't be like Iron Man, it's be like Tony Stark and always be prototyping. If there's one thing that we have learned from, from doing this for a couple of years, it's that lots of the things we thought were gonna work didn't, lots of solutions from flat UI didn't translate, um, what works in even one circumstance in spatial UX didn't work in another circumstance until we had to modify it. And so if there's a way to sort of channel our inner Tony Starks, it's to always be prototyping. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was, uh, traditional augmented reality systems tend to use an inertial tracking or an accelerometer-based way to anchor holograms. There's a notion called world lock, which is that when I tell a digital object to be on this table, it's on this table, and if I move around, it doesn't move, but if I come back later, it's still there. So, without getting into too much of the details, um, the HoloLens specifically um, uses a solution called inside-out tracking, which is a combination of optical tracking and then inertial tracking. Um, so effectively what it's doing is it's building a, a digital mesh of this room and then placing objects within that and it's doing that primarily with a set of optics. So you're getting fixed tracking from the optical, the corrector inertial? Yes, yeah, and so, um, and that, you know, people come to us and talk to us and say, well, you know, are you guys just, do you guys just do a hollow and stuff? Uh, are you guys open to working on other technologies? And our continuing answer is, yes, we are open to working on other technologies. It just happens to be that Microsoft and HoloLens is so far out ahead in front of everyone else that if you're looking at doing mixed reality, especially mixed reality for enterprise or, or business, um, it's by far the, 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 most, the best platform out there today for that. So you had the same problems in magnetic tracking as far as like metal and metal? Yes, and if you look at other solutions that don't do optical tracking, they, have, they suck. Um, Yeah, so the question was, you know, what are the challenges in working with the space and transportation? So there's a couple of projects that we're working on, that we're starting to work on now, where we're starting to investigate that, and the short answer is, um, uh, the way that I, what's that? <laughs> it, it's challenging, um, and there's, you can talk about it from a technical point of view, you can talk about it from a, from a user point of view. Um, oh, that's just a giant topic. Um, the one thing I would say is that, that uh, when we start to get into mixed reality space, we start to deal with sensor fusion, right? So sensor fusion is, we aren't just, you know, we're not just looking at one input, we're looking at lots of inputs. So it's important to be able to not only know where the user is, but where the car is within the environment, where its orientation is, and lots of other things. One of the interesting challenges, like if you came to our office today, we have a giant open space in the middle of our office, and the reason for that is because holograms take up space. The industrial design project with the motorcycle at Microsoft, I had, to, I had to walk a motorcycle through the halls at Microsoft to bring it to our workspace because we were wrapping holograms around it. Like, that is the unique difference in working on that space. It's not everyone stuck at their screen. It's, okay, well, maybe we have to build a full-size excavator. How do we get that in the office? There's a company up in Vancouver called Finger Food who works with Packard, the, the, the semi-tractor trailer company. They have like a 26,000 square foot warehouse where they have full-size tractor trailers in there because they're anchoring holograms on them and using them in, in, in design and training applications.
<laughs> no. <laughs> the question was, how do you deal with dynamic objects, meaning like people and moving in the environment? Um, there are experimental technologies that are doing that right now, um, but a lot of the tracking technology works very well with fixed objects. There are ways to sort of work around those problems. Um, uh, again, we're at the very beginning of this space. If I had to put my prognostication hat on and say, what is the next, what is the V2 of HoloLens look like? What is the, you know, the devices that are gonna win, you know, they're gonna supersede HoloLens. One of the big things they're gonna need to do is object tracking because uh, two reasons. One, it opens up a whole new set of scenarios. It makes a bunch of scenarios we deal with today very, very much easier, and it opens up a whole bunch of new scenarios as soon as you can track people and objects in an environment dynamically. Hey, so I had a question, actually. Over here, hi. <laughs> um, so I really love the idea of the example you gave with the bracelet of UI. Um, and I think HoloLens would be kind of a great direction for this too, but I'm curious if you've seen really great examples of UI that's specifically designed for accessibility because the wrist bracelet thing's great, but what if like that's going to feel very weird to someone who maybe doesn't have that yeah. mobility? So I'm curious what you've seen out there. That's a really great example of that. Um, that's a really good question. I, I nothing immediately. There's nothing that immediately comes to mind where I can say, oh, that's a really good example of addressing sort of. Um, accessibility or mobility issues. The one thing that we have found that is effective is um, voice can be incredibly effective for a lot of people. Um, that obviously doesn't help people with um, uh, speech issues, speech pathology issues, but it definitely is for um, common, you know, for most people, a very effective way of interacting. One of the things we're finding, one of the things that as we continue to look at technology and evaluate technologies, um, two places that and this goes back to, I think, what you were talking about with respect to chatbots and machine learning, um, is anything that doubles down on machine learning, anything that doubles down on computer vision, anything that doubles down on um, natural language processing is just going to get exponentially better over time. And uh, that, I think, is going to allow us to create more natural interactions because we're able to better understand and interpret what human beings are doing. Um, and then, rather than asking them to learn the systems that we're putting in front of them. Sure, so the question was about the tools in the space. Um, it's interesting, I actually get this question, the, one of the ways I get this question a lot is um, from um, uh, people that are, that are just entering the industry or students who are looking to enter the industry, like what are the tools that I could use to design for this? Um, the reality is today, it's a very technical space. Um, the most common tool that we use is, is Unity. Unity comes from the game industry. Um, and is a you know is a multi-purpose or a general purpose 3D engine with a, a coding layer built on top of it, um, and it requires engineering knowledge. It requires knowledge of creating 3D art content. Um, for people that are coming from a traditional design or a visual design background, especially students, one of the things that I encourage them to do, and this has a lot more to do with UI than I think UX, is um, people. We've we've had a lot of success bringing in folks who come from a motion design background, so people that have done motion graphics or lots of motion design, um, and especially coming from a 3D space, so people that have spent a lot of time in Cinema 4D, a lot of people coming from the broadcast space, because they're able to combine a couple of sets of skills. They're able to combine traditional design skills, meaning visual design, how do I communicate information, how do I use a grid and type of color to communicate information with 3D skills, how do I get comfortable with the idea of space, light, camera, materials, animation, and bringing those together to communicate information. So we found that those folks have the ability to express ideas in a way that allow us to bootstrap it into something that's interactive that is a lot further down the road at V1 or at the first prototype than if it's come out of a wireframing application or something that started in 2D. Um, so uh, you know, that, that's, that's often my spiel for, for, for you know, students and you know, people just starting out who want to get into or interested in this space and coming from maybe a traditional uh, design or UX background. I, I kind of meant more about evaluation. Do you think oh. you would listen more from the user aspect of how you're dealing with that and as a yeah. I kind of information 
So yeah, so with respect to user research then, and, yeah. and, and UX testing and validation. Um, I, the, the, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with the, the, the tools that are commonly used in, in flat design. Like I said, a lot of my background comes prior to Holland's from games. In that space, we do a lot of UX and user testing. Um, Microsoft, um, the games group Microsoft was really pioneered bringing um, uh, uh, PhDs um, into the user testing process for games um, and evaluating. Um, and a lot of that work was, was bespoke, so I, I can't really unfortunately speak to the, to the, to the tools. It's a, it's a very new space. was around looking from a background of architecture and design, how are we thinking about the design of the tangible elements, not just the digital elements? Um, I, I think it's a really, really interesting question because you know, so much of, I think that this space is so new that the ability to put digital information into the real world hasn't seeped into enough people's everyday use to start to influence the, the physical world around it. So much of what we're, so much of what people focus on today is this ability to take digital information and put it in the context of reality. One of the things that I always talk about with this is um, we've really grown blind to how much cognitive load is required to take the information around us in reality and then distill it down to text or a picture, or a graphic design, and then give that to someone else, and then ask them to unpack it and use their brain to like tell me what you were trying to say about the real world. Like art and things like that are great. It's all about it's all about interpretation. But if I'm just trying to communicate something to you, holy crap, is that a lot of work? Why don't I just take you there, or show it to you, or be able to bring it to you in 3D? That kind of feedback loop, we're just starting to understand that now. And I'm really interested to think more about what you're saying, which is how does that start to change the physical world around us? I think one of the things that will change is that the, 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 the I'll go back to like 20, 30 years ago, right? Like there used to be this idea of like your online life and your offline life, that, that, stopped, to, that stopped being a difference probably about 10 years ago. I think the difference between the physical world and the digital world in terms of the importance we put on things like what my avatar looks like in a meeting in Japan when I'm not there is as important as how I got dressed today. The way we use our physical environment to express ourselves, the, the, the mel melding of those two will make, you know, fashion designers aren't gonna go away, they're just gonna stop working exclusively in cloth, right? Industrial designers aren't gonna go away, they're just gonna stop working exclusively in, in you know, anodized aluminum and stuff. He had it first. Um, when you're making spatial UI, does it benefit from volumetric? Because it looks like all of the UI is still flat in space. So the question was, when you're dealing with UI, does it benefit from being volumetric? Um, yes. <laughs> it, the short answer is it does. I think that. I think that 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 would. We're just starting, I think, to find examples of that where it's really effective. And the analogy I use is, if you remember back to like the first release of the iPhone, you know, for the first two versions of iOS, it was all virtual buttons. It was basically taking desktop metaphor and physical metaphors and you know moving it into this thing. And now, so much of that virtual buttons have gone away. Like, if I can't swipe, you know, right on an app to go back. It's like, what's wrong with this piece of crap app? Like, it, it's, it's no longer intuitive the way it should be. If I've got to reach up to the top left-hand corner to click a button, I'm just like, your app sucks, like that blows my mind. So like, the natural and intuitive volumetric UI 
I don't think anyone has come up with, I'm trying to think of a, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of like a great example of that. There's probably one, and there's actually a, a, a longer version of this talk. Uh, there's, a, there's a virtual painting app that Google did called Tilt Brush that uses the hand controls of the Vive, which is this great sense of presence, this beautiful physical tracking, and they use a palette and brush metaphor. And so I have a, effectively a brush in one hand, and then I have this four-sided palette in the other hand. And what's brilliant about it is, um, so much of the problems with, 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 with spatial UI is about occlusion and about clipping and about Z depth and like, I can't put a menu here if I'm focusing on something on the back wall because that just breaks your brain. And I can't put it through the wall either and I, I can't clip as well. So when this palette's attached to my hand, when it gets inside my work and I can't see it, I have to move my hand. Like I don't even think about it. It's like if I wanted to look at something behind my laptop, I would do that or I would do that. Like, that intuitive reaction is beautiful. And so when we start to think about what spatial UI means, I think it's getting people comfortable with the idea of, well, how would you do it in reality? You know, what would you just do? What would be your natural and intuitive reaction? I showed a picture of Robo Ray, the game, and I like showing it to people because I've got five minutes of great, it's a great mixed reality demo, but the best part of it is when the aliens start shooting back because everyone goes, oh God, and they, like they don't even think about it. Their lizard brain kicks in and they move. And it's, that's UI, like that's, that's, that's design. Like that interaction was, you know, Oh, there's there's danger coming at me. I need to get out of the way. So like those are the things I think about when I when you ask the question of like what's a good example of why metric UI is? How does it replicate what feels natural? I think one more. So what do you think? What do you think the timeline is for like broad adoption or something like that? The reason I'm asking is people like me um, who grew up even without computers. Uh, they, they're, used, they're used to quirks, they're, they're used to work around. They, I'm not expecting anything to be perfect. Uh, the new generation does. And, and if it's not perfect, it's just sh crap, right? Uh, even the connect, like it's, it's, it was fun five minutes. It's super gimmicky. Huh? What, what do you think the timeline is for something perfect to come out? Perfect? Per like that my wife would adopt. My, my co-founder is saying five years. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think I think we're looking at life around five years. And the reason I say that is twofold is I think we're gonna see a convergence through two different areas. I think we're going to see um, screen-based augmented reality like Snapchat does today and like all the rumors saying what the next iPhone is gonna do better and what uh, Google's doing with Tango, right? I think we're gonna see a trend there which is about digital information in the real world mitigated through screens. And then we're gonna see stuff like HoloLens which is, um, you know, volumetric 3D information in the world around me. And there is a big difference, both in terms of the experience of it and the impact of the value of it. But I think what's gonna happen is this is gonna come from a consumer-driven angle, and this is gonna come from an enterprise and a business-driven angle where there is more forgiveness for things that aren't great, um, and the constraints can be a little bit clearer. And it's gonna be the, it's when the two of those intersect that is, I think we're gonna see the, the equivalent of the iPhone, which is like instantly out of the gate sells, I don't know what I sold, iPhone sold first year, but it was like 10 million, it's something crazy like that. Like, it's gonna be that, so, cool. Thank you guys very much. Hi, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think I speak for everyone when I say we could like spend the day with you. It's, you're fabulous, thanks.